Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting seminar in our online evolution and ecology series. My name is Julia Darozzi. I'm a postdoc in Judith Manx lab at the University of British Columbia. And before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to quickly remind everyone that, as always, there will be a Q&A session after the talk. If you would like to post questions for the speaker, you can do so in our Slack channel, where you can also upvote with a thumbs up questions that you would like to see answered. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today Professor Siemens Sandberg from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Siemens research focuses on understanding how genomes evolve and how novel genetic variation following whole genome duplication is linked to adaptation. He has previously worked on understanding the evolution of freezing tolerance in grasses and was involved in the International Red Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium studying among many things, the evolutionary history of the polyploid hybrid wheats. He then changed his focus from plants to salmonids, being part of the International Consortium to Sequence the Atlantic Salmon Genome, and studying how whole genome duplication in vertebrates drives evolutionary innovation, which is also the topic of his talk today. So thank you very much, Stephen, for accepting our invitation, and over to you. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure, really. So hello, everyone uh, that I don't see out there. I'm Simon um, Rød Sandve. And um, yeah, I will speak to you about evolution of gene regulation following whole genome duplication in salmonids. So for those of you that don't know me or my university, this is the Norwegian University of Life Sciences at its the peak of its beauty in the early summer. Looks kind of like this now too, actually. And it wins awards for the most beautiful campus in Norway every year. I think it's, um, yeah, it, it's deserved. A little bit in more geographical context, this is the university uh, in the square there. And at the back, you can see Oslo. So it's just 30 kilometers south, south of Oslo in a rural agricultural setting. So. That was the university I'm at. Enough about geography, I think now. Let's go to salmonids instead. It's more fun, at least I think so. Um, <clears throat> this is the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce the salmonid study system I'm working with. And then I'm gonna switch to gene regulatory evolution. Uh, first, I'm gonna give some uh, insights from previous studies where we use multi-tissue atlases to study gene regulation, gene regulatory evolution. And then, uh, then I will switch to the main part, which will be about tissue expression level evolution uh, and how we use a kind of a novel approach, a phylogenetic comparative approach to um, study this in salmonids. That will be most of the talk. And at the very end, I will touch upon the links between tissue expression evolution and cis regulatory element evolution. Okay, so who are those salmonids? I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with salmon and salmonids, but maybe some of you are not. So here they are, <clears throat> a bunch of them at least. Uh, salmonids are about 150 species of fish uh, that are belong to six main lineages. So the names here at the tips are kind of random representatives or of species or even a group of species, the Pacific salmon at the end here. So they don't represent the entire species diversity, of course. And uh, yeah, why I ended up studying salmonids when, uh, as Julia said, I started out with grasses. I think it has to do with uh, the culture and the cache of Atlantic salmon in Norway, really. Uh, Norway has the biggest population of wild Atlantic salmon in the world, so we have some kind of extra responsibility for understanding and, and conserving Atlantic salmon. But, and Atlantic salmon fishing has a big part of Norwegian culture, and here you can see the king, our king, uh, much younger than he is now, with a very proud uh, specimen of Atlantic salmon. And at the bottom there, you can see a typical Norwegian salmon farm in a typical Norwegian fjord. And the salmon aquaculture is now our second largest uh, economic 
um, activity in Norway. This is the biggest export, second biggest after oil. So this is kind of our future when we go all green and stop using uh, oil and gas. Okay, <clears throat> then the talk today is about using salmonids as a model system for genome evolution and whole genome duplication. So I'm going to switch to that now. So there are at least three good reasons for why I think, or why we should all think salmonids are very, a very interesting model for studying whole genome duplication and evolution of genomes. Firstly, uh, they have a fairly recent whole genome duplication. So it's not very recent. So the duplicates have diverged quite a bit, but it's not very old either. So we have many duplicates to study. Then we are starting to have a great genomic, or basically we have great genomic resources for these pieces now. We have more than 10 really high quality genome assemblies out there. Some are not completely published yet, but, but soon to be. And we have hundreds of RNA seq data sets and other functional omics data set to play with. Lastly, they also have a fairly uh, close out group that we can use uh, when we want to estimate uh, the ancestral states of, of gene expression patterns, for example. And here, this is represented with a, a northern pike um, here at the bottom. But there are also other assemb uh, assemblies and other species in that group. Okay. So, um, yes, let's uh, do a little salmon and genome 101 before we go on to talk about genome regulatory evolution, because it's important to understand a little bit about the genome structure. And uh, so here you can see uh, the salmon uh, lineage tree and the duplication here at the end. And the ancestral karyotype was 25 chromosomes after duplication, of course, uh, 50 chromosomes. But uh, through speciation and radiation, this, this number of chromosomes has, has changed and, and evolved uh, quite rapidly in some lineages. Uh, so today uh, we have some only species with 50 chromosomes still and other species with 29. However, when they have 29 chromosomes, it doesn't mean that they have lost a lot of genetic, duplicated genetic material, material as we should see for the Atlantic salmon as an example here. So Atlantic salmon has 29 chromosomes. However, it still has most of its genome duplicated. It's just that the karyotype is really shuffled and the duplicated segments have been like mixed and matched uh, and chromosomes joined to reduce the number of total chromosomes. So this here, as you probably many of you recognize, is a circus plot where you have uh, the uh, each chromosome here around. So chromosome one, two, three, etc., and all these bands crisscrossing here, they are duplicated segments originating from the salmonid whole genome duplication. And as you can see, there are bands almost covering the entire genome, meaning that very little large-scale genomic fragments have been lost, uh, basically, after, after the duplication. However, if you zoom in on the gene level, the picture is slightly different. Um, so you can do this exercise where you count the number of genes that has uh, a duplication in uh, or a retained duplicate in the salmon species, and those that had the ancestral loss that has returned to a singleton copy in all salmonid species. And if you do this, you find that about 50 to 60% of the genes in the salmonid genomes have been retained as duplicates today, still retained as duplicates today. Um, that means that we can study in the order of 10 to maybe 15,000 duplicate pairs when we study uh, salmonid genomes. Uh, this pattern is really similar in all salmonid species that we have investigated so far. So it seems that none of the lineages have lost much faster or uh, duplicate copies. <clears throat> okay, that was it. That was the genome structure part. And so let's go to the regulatory evolution part. How does whole genome duplication impact evolution of gene regulation? 
So the first part of this, uh, this section of the talk will be about tissue regulatory evolution, because this was the first thing that was done in salmonid genomes. So basically what I'm gonna tell you now is um, <clears throat> um, a brief summary of, of two papers, uh, the Camille Bartelot paper from the Rainbow Trout Genome from 2014 and the Atlantic Salmon Genome paper. So these first papers, what they did was that they, they compiled a tissue atlas uh, of 15, uh, about 15 tissues and measured gene expression using RNA-seq. And then what they did they clustered all these genes or they correlated them. So they make co-expression uh, groups, as you see here. So basically each row here is a gene and each uh, group, A, B, C, D, are groups or genes that are regulated similarly uh, across tissues. So when we have this, we can now start to ask questions. Uh, so let's say we, we go into a random duplicate pair and we can ask if they are similarly expressed, if they are in the same co-expression group, co if they're co-regulated, or alternatively, if they're uh, in very different co-expression groups or have diverged tissue regulation. And if you count, do some counting exercise again, you end up with about of the of the retained duplicates about 50% of them have quite distinct or divergent tissue regulation if you do this exercise okay <clears throat> next question that arises how how does this gene regulatory reg, this um, does gene regulation diverge and, and what's the mode of the divergence so basically up until now we just have the information that a duplicate pair is either similar or different. In this case, we have two duplicate pairs, one here and one there. They're both different in regulation, marked by different colors, right? And then the question is, if we go back in time to the ancestor, what is the, does the divergence look like? Is it symmetric like this? Or is it entirely asymmetric like this, where one copy retains the ancestral regulation while the other one does something new. And this is interesting to understand because it has implications for uh, what mechanisms that drive regulatory divergence of the genome duplication or gene duplication. So for example, when we have the very symmetric divergence, we, this hints toward a, a subdivisional function between the copies, right? But if you have this very asymmetric divergence, then this is more what we expect from a case where we have a new function has arisen in the gene, a new expression or regulatory function, for example, or tissue specialization, or also very important that this has completely lost its function and now is towards a slow death becoming a pseudo gene, for example. So <clears throat> to get to this type of question, we need uh, outgroup data so we can guesstimate the ancestral state and see if the, the divergence is symmetric or asymmetric. So <clears throat> this is uh, a, an analysis we did in the Atlantic Salmon genome paper. So we, we added pike into the mix. So if you remember in the beginning, there was this relatively recent outgroup, northern pike, and we had uh, tissue expression data from that species too. So we defined 8,000 of these triplets, two duplicates from salmon and the closest ortholog in pike. And then we uh, asked the question, uh, to what extent do we see symmetric or asymmetric divergence? And the biggest category uh, was the conserved triplets actually. So uh, where you have pretty much the same tissue regulatory patterns across all uh, three genes, the two duplicates and the ortholog. If you look at the symmetric, uh, typical uh, what we expect from a symmetric divergence. This was almost zero. So, uh, where this is the extreme case, of course, we will search for. Very little evidence for this, but quite a lot of evidence for this asymmetric divergence where one of the salmon duplicates have, have, was regulated very differently, which you can see here to the left panel. If you squint your eyes a bit, you can see that the pattern in the heat map here is quite distinct from these two patterns here. 
And that's basically if you do some number crunching, you, uh, you get to 28% uh, here. And we are, of course, in this exercise, we had a lot of genes that were difficult to classify. So that was a not optimal strategy. Okay, <clears throat> so now we know, we also done this in another salmonid species after this. So we have two uh, independent analysis using Pike showing that this asymmetric divergence is really dominating. The question now is, is this very common uh, after whole genome duplication in teleosts or vertebrates as a whole? This is an interesting question. And uh, we did some work on this uh, uh, using GAR as an outgroup with Zebra Fish and Medaka as, as uh, having the 3R duplication. It basically shows very similar patterns, the, the asymmetric divergence dominates. And after that, or later, or I don't know, maybe slightly before, this really fantastic paper, the Amphioxus genome paper, showed kind of the similar trends for the very ancient genome duplication in the vertebrates. So it seems like that is some kind of consensus. So to summarize briefly, um, we have uh, 50% of the salmonid uh, genome duplication duplicates are still retained after 100 million years of evolution. And 50% of those, again, have quite divergent tissue regulation. And most of this divergent tissue regulation looks like a very asymmetric uh, style of diverging, like this picture here. <clears throat> then a question arises, right? The obvious question. So what is the evidence that, that what we see here is, is adaptive at all? Or is it just neutral, a neutral evolution of a redundant copy? Well, so far, all the analysis I've talked about has used one or two species and made some pairwise comparisons like this here. And this strategy is fine uh, for many purposes, but it has some challenges too. So one challenge with this strategy is that it's very difficult to distinguish between different evolutionary scenarios. So for example, if we had added uh, gene expression data for all these species, this picture might have looked something like this, right? Here we have one duplicate clade that has a very ancestral and conserved expression phenotype, and the other clade here is all over the place. So basically the one we selected or the one we studied in one species, is, for example, expressed very highly, but the other varies a lot between different species. So this to me looks more like random drift and neutral evolution rather than selection at least that's more likely. But also if we had studied another gene, it might have looked something like this, if we had had the data from all the species. And this situation uh, resembles much more a fixation of regulatory mutation in the ancestor of these duplicates. And uh, after that, you have conservation of this novel expression phenotype, which is a typical signature of adaptive evolution, at least something we think of as a signature of adaptive evolution. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, definitely we need, I think it's clear that we need to move from pairwise comparisons in comparative functional genomics to more model-based uh, approaches uh, where we try to model um, uh, functional or a gene expression, for example, through time across the phylogeny. And when you're really frustrated, you, you at least I, turn to Google, uh, and then so I Google gene expression variation evolution across a phylogeny. I, hope, I just hope that someone had solved my problem. And of course, there are very many smart people out there, and, and one of them turned out to be Rory Rolfs, which is this first hit in my Google search, her paper modeling gene expression evolution with an extended ornstein ulmbeck model. And this is Rory. So after Googling a bit, I sent her an email. She was really positive, and we started the collaboration together with my other collaborator, Tori Guide, So Rory's, Rory had developed this um, mod or modeling framework for studying gene expression evolution across phylogeny, And this is based on the ornstein ulbeck model. And I'm not the biostatistician, so I'm not going to lecture you in the, in the details of this model at all, but I thought I, I will try at least, hopefully there's not too many biostatisticians out there listening, but um, 
uh, I think I will try to give you uh, an overview of how this model works. So basically this OU model is an extension of, of a Brownian motion model, which is a model of neutral evolution or drift. So here at the y-axis, you have expression phenotype and uh, at the x-axis, you have time. And as you see under a Brownian motion model, these expression um, phenotypes just drift away randomly. So the OU process model that, that Rory uh, helped us um, apply to our data uh, has additional parameters, which um, uh, can be interpreted as parameters that uh, tell you something about selection on this gene expression phenotype. So kind of selective constraints. So the first parameter is uh, what I call uh, as a biologist, the squeeze parameter, uh, probably the biostatistician call it something else. It kind of, it reflects selection strength or the constraints. So it reflects how much uh, this gene expression phenotype is allowed to drift and change over time. Then we have another uh, parameter here, the expression optimum, which, which is kind of the mean of expression level. Okay, so this is the, 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 the model in a nutshell. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about shifts in expression levels or shift in expression level optimum. And this is, if you remember this, uh, uh, the mean of the expression level, right? So when we talk, when we have applied this model to our data, we have not uh, looked at the parameters of, of uh, selection strength, but only the shift in expression level. So what we uh, thought to uh, plan to do was use this model and study the, the, um, uh, the evolution of gene expression on the internal branches here, after whole genome duplication, but before speciation and ask after genome duplication, do we see no change in expression level optimum or do we see a change either up and down? So this next part of the talk will all be about how we detected, detected expression level evolution after whole genome duplication using this comparative phylogenetic approach. Okay, so this is the experiment. So we had, we had seven species in this experiment, three outgroups and four salmonids. And for each of the species, we had four biological replicates of liver. And we basically produced RNA sequencing data for all of those. <clears throat> then um, we studied gene expression evolution across 7,000 gene trees. 4,000 of these had retained duplicates from the whole genome duplication in some on it. We allowed some of these trees to have missing duplicates for some species. So, uh, so they were not all complete. And then we had 3000 kind of control gene trees where uh, we had, uh, we see um, where the gene had returned to a single copy state uh, just after whole genome duplication. Okay, and then what did we do? Well, we used this model, uh, Rory's model, to uh, do model comparisons. So we tested, uh, we looked at the, we compared the likelihoods of a model where we allowed expression levels to change after whole genome duplication uh, with models where we, um, with a model where we constrain the expression level to the ancestral expression level before whole genome duplication. And then we could classify expression evolution into five distinct categories. As you see here, the two to the very left here, there we have gene trees where we have one duplicate evolves a new expression level, either up or down, and the other one has a conserved expression level, an ancestral-like expression level, if you may. Then we have the gene trees where both duplicates evolve novel expression levels. And then we have the same here, but here is the opposite direction. So one duplicate that was higher and the other one lower. So here's the result from this analysis. Uh, as, as you can see here, on the x-axis, we have the proportion of gene trees with an expression level shift. 
and the light blue here represents those with expression level shift in one duplicate and the darker colors both duplicates. Same with the red here. So two things pop out. One, there is more shifts in gene trees with a duplicate. That's very clear, almost double. And then there is many more down shifts. So many more shift in expression level towards a lower expression level after whole genome duplication. So these are the uh, main results that I will um, dig a little bit into uh, during the next slides. Okay, but first, one thing we were curious about is how tissue specific is this, are these shifts in, uh, in expression evolution or in expression levels. So are we looking at really specific shifts in liver only, or are we looking at regulatory, uh, new regulatory phenotypes that um, impacts many tissues? And uh, to look into this, we basically chose um, duplicates that come, or we looked at these duplicates that are where either one of the duplicate is up, or another one downshift after whole genome duplication. So we, in this way, we can compare directly the conserved copy that didn't change the expression level at all with the shift copy. And what we did here is a fairly naive thing. We simply, we used to took advantage of the tissue expression atlases that we had, and we just asked for those that shifted, how many other tissues has a, sh has a sh kind of a shift in the same direction. So for the upregulated, um, after whole genome duplication, how many other tissues has a higher expression level than the conserved duplicate? And if you do this, you get these distributions, which shows you that most of these genes that we detect have an expression level shift after whole genome duplication, has an expression level shift across many, many tissues. Actually, most of them, as in most tissues, or actually all tissues, I mean, sorry. And very, very few represent tissue-specific uh, novel uh, expression phenotypes. <clears throat> so then, OK, so we have a whole genome duplication. We have most of the expression evolution is loss of expression, actually, or repression of expression. And then this question, I mean, this apparent question is, are these just simply genes that are dying? And we wanted to understand this a little bit more. And to do this, we looked for signatures of relaxed purifying selection pressure in the downshifted copy compared to the conserved copy, because this is what you expect if a gene starts to lose its function in the genome. So we did this in two ways. First, we estimated uh, the NDS uh, rates with the expectation that if a gene is uh, losing its function and becomes a pseudogene or on its way to becoming a pseudogene, then basically the NDS would be higher in, uh, in those uh, genes, those duplicates. And this is exactly what we see. Although the, I have to say that we see that in both uh, downshifted, but also even more if, if it's downshifted in, across all tissues. And, um, I also want to point out that the effect size there is not enormous. So there are other things in play than pseudogenization most likely. We also did the same with the promoter. So we asked uh, one thing that is known to happen when genes are, are redundant and uh, on the way to become pseudogene is that promoters are often, um, or transposable element insertions are not often not purged out by selection, so you get an accumulation of TEs in the promoter. And we also see a lot more TEs in the promoters of those downshifted uh, copies compared to the conserved copies. So this is also evidence for relaxed period selection. But also here, we, effect size is not very large, so uh, it's not only pseudogenization for sure. Or at least the pseudogenization process is very slow. OK. <clears throat> Next thing we did to dig more into if, uh, if expression shifts after whole genome duplication is mostly just random or if there is some signature of adaptive 
adaptiveness or selection on, on a gene expression that is causing these shifts. Uh, so what we did was that we took all these um, gene, these, these classes of gene expression shifts, and then we associate the, or we try to associate them with, uh, or we, sorry, we did an enrichment test for keg pathways for all of these genes in the different classes of regulatory evolution. So here's the results from this test. So on the y-axis here, you have the different keg pathways. And on the x-axis, you have the keg enrichment p-value. And I think we can say that there are some kind of clear signatures of some pathways that are high, highly or relatively highly enriched in these genes that have a expression evolution or expression shift after whole genome duplication. So this is interesting. And if you look more into detail, uh, we see uh, cell cycle, cell division uh, genes being um, highly enriched in those genes that are upregulated after whole genome duplication or gain expression. And then for those that uh, lose expression or repress expression, we have um, terms like oxidative phosphorylation, which is uh, basically energy production. But these are not mitochondrial genes, but uh, mitochondrial genes that we that have been inserted into the nuclear genome. So, not which is um, and um, and then we have the ribosome subunit genes that come out really strong. Um, they these might not seem so related, but if you go into the literature and read, uh, you find that very many of these genes or pathways are, are have been linked either through other studies of, of selection in Arabidopsis uh, or in yeast, um, or more experimental studies with yeast, for example, where they manipulate the ROS levels uh, and look at genome stability. So all of these processes can be tied to genome stability uh, after all. And this is really interesting because this is, must be something that uh, is a problem when you um, be, uh, get the, your, all your chromosomes duplicated, not to have a messy meiosis, basically. Okay, another thing that I think is interesting with this plot is these two dots here. And the reason I think it's interesting is that they're really highly enriched keg pathways, but they are enriched only in these different classes of regulatory evolution, where either one duplicate or both duplicates uh, are um, gets lower expression after whole genome duplication. This points towards that some the different pathways take actually different routes towards a reduction in the total transcript abundance. And although we don't really fully understand what drives this, uh, it's possible that, for example, um, for some uh, genes, uh, it's much easier to, to tweak the expression of a trans factor. So it's much easier to, to get the fixation of a transmutation. And that will be the ribosome because then both of these duplicates will be, be um, uh, regulated this. similarly. If you if you change a, a, a transcription factor that, that regulates these genes, um, while other other um, uh, pathways have have more this asymmetric way of, of getting rid of transcripts. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a, a brief summary number two. Um, it seems like redundancy boosts expression evolution, uh, and much of this is down regulation. Um, but not all of it is, and not all of these genes that are shifted down looks to be pseudogens uh, or pseudogenized. Uh, some are really conserved at the sequence level still. Um, and then these functional enrichment tests suggest that that there has been some selection to possibly rescue genome stability in the aftermath of whole genome duplication. Okay, <clears throat> so then it's part for me, the last part. Cis regulatory evolution and its links to expression evolution. Well, <clears throat> what we did here was that we wanted to look into the regulatory evolution from a mechanistic point of view more. 
So we um, generated some some attack sec data, and then we performed some transcription factor binding site footprinting and compared the results. Basically, the approach was to define promoters of, of genes. Then we <clears throat> map these attack sec data. Basically, and the attack sec data reflects where in the chromatin or where the chromatin is open, where transcription factors sit on the genome. And then we can use some tools, and we used a tool called Tobias to search in these open chromatin signatures for an actual um, signatures of transcription factor occupancy. So they're referred to as BTFBS, bound transcription factor binding sites. And then step two is then to, to compare duplicates, basically. And uh, uh, we did a little sanity check because we were met with this question from several people like this transcription factor footprinting. This is people have heard that it doesn't work, but it, it seems like now uh, softwares to, to, to crunch attack data now, if you have good, good attack data, seem to give some biological sensible output at least. So um, this plot is a volcano plot where you, uh, on the x-axis here, have, so each dot is a transcription factor binding motif. So it's not one site in the genome, but it's a motif across the entire genome and the x-axis here is more bound in liver to the right and more bound by T this tf or tfs in brain to the left and uh there's the p-value on the y-axis and then these red dots they are just uh, some transcription factors that we picked from a mammalian paper that was supposed to be biased towards liver and certainly it looks like it makes sense in our data that these are quite highly liver biased transcription so we believe this data has uh, quite okay biological signal. So what we then did was we asked a, a relatively naive question first. So is there a connection between the number of bound transcription factors in the promoter and expression level? So for each uh, class, class of, of regulatory evolution here in duplicates, we will have two boxes. The box to the left are the duplicates in, within a pair that has the most, that is shifted the most, the lowest p-value basically. And so here to the right, you see the box plots for the duplicates that has didn't shift expression at all after whole genome duplication. They have a similar uh, distribution, which is good, it makes sense. Uh, if you look at the other categories, um, it seems like there is some, uh, a fairly good uh, association between the, the base, the, quite naive statistics, the number of transcription factors predicted to be bound in the promoter and the expression level. So another thing you can see is that the more asymmetric expression divergence also have a bigger difference uh, in the number of bound transcription factor binding sites in the promoter. So that uh, also is kind of interesting. Okay, <clears throat> the reason really we were interested in this was to look more into detail into cis regulatory evolution of the few genes that we find that has this very tissue specific increase because we had 30 pairs of, of duplicates that where one of the duplicates evolved highly liver specific gain in expression and these are kind of candidates for uh, adaptive gain in dosage in a way so we were interested in understanding the regulatory mechanistic behind this this shift how high, how this occurred so what we did here was we took all of these duplicates, conserved version and the upregulated version, and we looked into the bound transcription factor binding sites of all of these, and we just pulled out all the transcription factors that bound to one or the other or both, and we selected those that were kind of liver specific. So here is a heat map of uh, tissue expression of the conserved copy. Uh, these are the gray here. Uh, and uh, the red uh, rows here are the upregulated duplicates, and the purple rows are transcription factors that are uh, have a quite liver-specific expression. So here you basically see, uh, and here are the TF, the names of the TFs, that, uh, and many of them are known liver-centric liver transcription factors. Okay, and then we asked, um, are there an, a big enrichment in this tissue liver specific transcription factor or bound 
liver specific transcription factors in the promoters of those upregulated duplicates. And uh, lo and behold, there is quite a high enrichment. So it seems like liver specificity or liver specific expression shifts uh, in these duplicates are very, um, are probably mechanistically linked to some gain uh, in liver specific transcription factor binding sites. Maybe not so surprising, but still uh, interestingly thought. Okay, so then I'm soon uh, done here with my talk, but then a few slides later at the end. So one thing that is in the wind now is right, transposable element and to what degree they are driving novel expression phenotypes, for example, when they insert themselves into the promoter. So we also wanted to ask this question, what extent does these transcription factor binding sites, which are very tissue, which drives or likely drives tissue specific expression, overlap with transposable elements. And uh, here is a, a plot showing the number of bound transcription factor binding sites that overlap TEs in the promoters of conserved here, conserved duplicates, or these upregulated in liver duplicates. And uh, if you look at all TEs, there is a big significant p value. Um, and if you go through all superfamilies of TEs that we have annotated, we find only one superfamily that also have a significant p-values, that's the TC1 mariners. And they're known to have been very active around the time of the whole genome duplication in the Salmon genome. And they're also the biggest group of transposable elements in the Salmon genome. So, so, so it's not maybe so strange that they come out here, but it's certainly interesting to see that, that they have contributed to, likely contributed to some uh, and uh, novel expression evolution phenotypes. So a brief summary three. This is my last summary before I go to some concluding thoughts. Um, so we find that the number of bound transcription factor binding sites, uh, so the number of these binding transcription factor binding sites that we predict is bound by a transcription factor, correlates with expression level evolution, or it correlates with expression level. And we also see that uh, tissue specific gains uh, in expression is associated with more tissue-specific transcription factor uh, binding sites, so basic. And then lastly, we see this uh, coupling to uh, transposable elements, which is kind of interesting. But we don't know yet if these transposable elements have donated these transcription factor binding sites by jumping around or if these binding sites have evolved by uh, through mutations of an old transposable element. This is something we're looking into now using some functional validation in assays. Okay, concluding thoughts. So I think I have, I hope I have convinced you that uh, our data suggests that after whole genome duplication, lots of genes shift expression level um, and that this expression level shift is at least partly um, linked to selection on transcript dosage. And it's interesting, I think, that now that more and more genomes come out uh, with lots of interesting analysis that uh, we, uh, and also lots of, lots more functional genomics data come out that we see kind of similar trends in totally different kingdoms. So these is our two papers that are recently published. You have to the right here, you have a paper by Song et al published in plant cells, and they generated new, new polyploids of Arabidopsis thaliana and found that in the first generation polyploids, translation, these ribosomal subunit proteins, they responded kind of what we see in, in uh, someone is today. So this is like plastic response, but what we see is more likely hard-coded in the DNA. And then this very, very recent preprint uh, on bioarchive by Burns et al. from the Norberg lab shows also that the young allopolyploid in Arabidopsis has upregulation of these G 
genes, the same genes that we find upregulated after 14 on replication in, in salmon of our cell division DNA replication meiosis related genes. Okay, so I was I thought I should try to end with some at least slightly maybe not provocative but some uh, some thoughts about what this means for theoretical models of gene duplicate evolution uh, are results and there are like two kind of very different models so how to think about uh, duplicate evolution and you have this model where uh, that that uh, has the hypothesis that stoichiometry of interacting molecules or genes is a very important selective force. Um, so if you have a duplication and you start to lose some of your duplicates, and then stoichiometry gets out of balance, and then either you can acquire a new copy or you could regulate the duplicates. You can lower the expression of the duplicates or you can increase the expression of the singleton to, to reinstate balance. I haven't shown you all the data that we have for this, but basically we see very little support for this type of scenario in our data in some moments. And then we have the other model where the selection operates on the total level of transcripts. Basically, maybe there's some magic ratio of transcripts uh, uh, transcript abundance per cell volume or something like this. It's, it's a little bit unclear exactly what this should be. Uh, so you either have too little of a transcript or too much. And uh, I think what we see uh, in our studies is that the, uh, the data is, is leaning towards that this is a more important selective uh, force or, or, and, or cause the selection on the expression of the whole genome duplication rather than the stoichiometry. Okay, so with this, I just say thanks for listening in. Um, I want to thank my funding body, the Research Council of Norway and the, my university, and also these fantastic people that I work with. I have absolutely not done this myself. Uh, Garrett Gillard and Lars Grenwell are to really bright postdocs that have worked hard on this project and Toy Guide and Rory are two other PIs that have been really instrumental in this whole project and then we have all the other co-authors and many discussions along the way which have sparked uh, which have made this this study better uh, and these are all mentioned here so thanks Thank you. That was a very, very interesting talk. Um, we have quite a few questions coming from, from the audience, so I'm just going to start with those. Um, have you looked at sex bias gene expression at all? Do, and do duplicated genes evolve sex biased or sex specific expression? <clears throat> um, there are certainly lots of genes with sex bias expression, but we haven't looked into it in a duplicate context. No. Hmm. Um, there's another question asking whether dosage sensitive genes and referring specifically to proteins that form heteromeric complexes, are they more likely to be retained after whole genome duplication? Um, or more yes, so, so I guess this is this slide, right? Uh, I didn't touch upon this um, or I didn't show data basically for this, but we have done a lot of statistics on this and we see a slight increase in retention in uh, for genes that are known to be in multi-protein complexes than those that are not. Uh, so it means that there are, is some signal that, that uh, aligns with this gene balance hypothesis, uh, which is kind of at least um, seems to be at least partly explaining retention of duplicates in plants. Um, but, uh, but what we did was that we extended upon this and then we tried to uh, make some predictions of, of what happened to expression if you have these uh, protein complexes. And then basically if you have protein complexes with duplicates and singletons and what would happen to singleton expression and so on, because that would, then you would expect this to try to be increased to balance out the duplicates or vice versa. 
Um, and uh, we don't see much uh, uh, evidence for this being uh, uh, very important. But uh, it might be that we have done the wrong tests or that other people can do it uh, in a better way. But yeah. That's very interesting. Um, there is another question asking how accurately can you distinguish the expression level of two duplicated genes that have uh, highly similar sequences? So, how, how yes. so what, what I didn't say much about uh, is the sequence similarity of the duplicated genome of the salmonids. And uh, since most of these duplicates diverged uh, far back in town, 80 million years, uh, or between 50 and 80 million years, um, they are pretty easily distinguishable. And we have done a lot of simulations, uh, simulating reads to look at uh, if we can detect a different expression. And that's not the big problem. There are parts of the genomes that have a very delayed redeplication, which have recombined for millions of years longer than other parts of the genome. It's very, it's a strange thing, but you can read this in some, we have a nice genome biology paper, uh, which was led by Dan McQueen on this. And, uh, and these genes are really, these duplicates are really difficult to distinguish, but we have not uh, included these in this analysis at all. So we have kind of left the very difficult duplicates uh, in the drawer and not looked at them. Thank you. Um, there's another question asking, when you compared the gene expression between pike and salmon, how did you normalize the gene expression? Uh, and are there housekeeping genes which are single copy in salmon and which are expressed, uh, expected to show similar expression level in both pike and salmon? Yes, good question. Uh, RNA-seq normalization. I'm, uh, <clears throat> so for the tissue uh, regulation um, study, we simply correlated the tissue expression and we didn't do much normalization there. Uh, but uh, this might be, a, might be, could be criticized for this, but I don't think it matters much really. We looked, lifted into this and it doesn't seem to matter much. We, we do use correlations across many tissues. However, uh, for this expression level, it, it matters a lot with normalization. And uh, I don't think I should go into it, but in this uh, preprint we have on this, uh, there is a huge section uh, on normalization and how we did it. And uh, basically we did a two-step normalization. We first did a, we normalized on the number of expressed genes because since, uh, since RNA-seq is relative, uh, then the more genes you express, basically the lower expression you're gonna have for all genes when you compare to a, gene, a genome with uh, less, fewer, basically fewer genes. So you need to do some normalization for this. And then we did, a, I think it was a quantile normalization strategy, but I don't remember the details. I was also wondering whether um, there's anything you can say about how salmon in specific whole genome duplication and the genome instability that's associated with that has um, shaped sex determination in, in this group of organisms. Um, so I, I think there's... Yeah, there is some lots of yeah. uh, research on sex determination in salmonids, and this is not my field. And uh, I cannot answer your question, but what I can say is that it seems like at least in, in, in Atlantic salmon, I think this also varies between species, so yeah. Everyone has to, you have to excuse me if I say something wrong now, if you are a specialist and listening in. But at least in that examen, there are, the sex determiner sits a different, can sit on different chromosomes uh, within the same population even. And some of this jumping of sex determining position uh, is associated with old duplicated segments. Um, but uh, I think Nikki Barson, for example, is a, a great person to contact uh, if you have interest in that. She's there doing a lot of, of really nice analysis on this now. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, there's another question asking, similar to the X chromosome inactivation in mammalian female cells, is there a case of inactivation of genes in a continuous segment of the, the duplicated chromosomes? That's something you... 
<laughs> oh, so the, I, I, if I understand this correct uh, question correctly, so is there like um, local blocks of uh, of the genome which is which have duplicated genes which are all downregulated? That that yes, is. That is. So, yeah. <clears throat> so that is a very good question indeed. So you have this concept of of, uh, of um, um, fractionation. So you have a, a duplication, and then in plants, at least, this happens quite quickly sometimes. That you have one of the duplicated chromosomes loses a lot of genes fast. So this is one th uh, way of looking at uh, kind of um, regional uh, differences in loss rates, and we we looked at that in this paper too that uh, I didn't show. And we find some evidence for this in some chromosomes, but not much. And then we also looked at the same concept uh, at the regulatory level, just as the, the, uh, the question or the person that asked the question was wondering about. And we find very little evidence really for this uh, regional suppression of co-suppression of genes or co-upregulation of genes. Yeah. But, um, we also only studied a proportion of the, not the whole genome with this gene tree. So it might be if we do it slightly differently that we see it, but I don't think there is much evidence to support that idea. No. Thank you. Um, you talked about testing whether expression level shifts after whole genome duplication are tissue specific or not. And I was wondering, if there would, if it would be interesting at all to to study the effects of whole genome duplication on developmental evolution as well, is there any expectation that genes expressed in earlier stages of development may be evolving differently from others, or are perhaps more or less preserved than others? Yeah, I've seen uh, some really uh, interesting data on this from I think it was the Kesselman lab. Uh, from mammalian development and, and other types of gene duplicates, I, I, if I'm not remembering wrongly here. Um, but anyway, I think what they show is that duplicates can be, can have a bigger variance in tissue regulation in the, in adult somatic cells than they have in, through embryo. So they're like more tightly regulated in an embryo. This will be, this is something that actually we, is, um, this question, we are trying to address in different salmonids together with Dan McQueen at the Roslin Institute. Uh, they are sampling a salmon through development and also other salmonids. And we are hoping to actually to address exactly this question in, in the years to come. Mm, that's very interesting. I look forward to, to seeing those results. Um, I think this is all the time we have for today, but thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for your excellent talk. Um, it was really my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, for everyone else watching, um, do join us again on Wednesday next week for another exciting talk. Uh, our speaker will be Professor Ruth Huffbauer from Colorado State University. Um, her talk title will be confirmed shortly, but she and her lab have done great work on plant insect interactions, um, the ecological and population genetic aspects of biological invasions, as well as eco evolutionary dynamics of range expansions. So I'm sure it will be a very interesting talk. Uh, until then, have a great week, everyone. Stay safe and 